Awesome. Wonderful. Well, hey, it's good to be back. Right on. Yay. It's good. Thank you. Uh, we had a wonderful vacation. It's good to be back. Robert and Emily, congratulations. It's good to see you guys right there. They got married. Yay. There we go. You, you got to know this. The best part of this is Robert, uh, Robert Chandler. It's so funny. Robert and Emily Chandler. Well, it was the most fun is uh, Robert was sitting in the very front row. Robert's never sat in the front row in his entire life. Robert sat in the front row because Emily was on the worship team for the first time today. Did you know the only, the only way to get him to sit in the front row is to get his, his wife up on the worship team? Well done, Emily. That was awesome. <laughs> Emily, you'll be up on the worship team every week now. <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, it's uh, fun. I've enjoyed um, watching their journey, and it's fun. They're such amazing people. Um, I will tell you this, Polly and I had a great time, uh, by the way, thank you for all of you, great sermons, great uh, leadership, our church is amazing, it was so fun to be away and have some time for rest and all that stuff, but thank you for all that you did in uh, taking care of all the stuff, I often wonder um, how, how things are going to go when Polly and I get away, I remember when we first were young pastors, I would constantly watch my email and my phone while I was gone, I could never really relax. Um, I've gotten over that. <laughs> so now I don't. I, I will tell you, uh, anyway, the, the, the best part. Polly, uh, this vacation was a little different. It was more of a staycation because Polly, remember, she was in a wheelchair and a walker and all that stuff. She had had, she had, had knee surgery prior. So we had been more doing physical therapy for her knee, so we couldn't really travel anywhere. Um, I will tell you this. Um, we, I've got to get mama out on a beach somewhere. Mama wants to go to some sunshine and a beach. Uh, this vacation was not that. So we didn't get to a beach. So we were more staycation-y. Uh, and so we stuck around home and, but I'll tell you this, we did things. We did stuff. Uh, we, we did stuff and things. We, and uh, we, uh, we did things and stuff. Uh, we were, well, I can tell you this, uh, I know the Amazon guy. Um, he came to our house a bunch. His name's Mike. He's like, hey, Lance. I was like, hey, Mike, good to see you again for the second time today. He would come by our house a lot. And I was like, why do you keep coming here? He's like, your wife, man, she buys a lot of things. So uh, Polly may not have gotten physical therapy, but she did a lot of shopping therapy. So uh, we got to go to a beach, so uh, we, will, we will work on getting her to a beach, so that doesn't happen, um, in Jesus' name, so we'll figure that out next time, uh, but I will tell you, um, I got some therapy that wasn't so Amazon-y, uh, I will tell you this, I, I, I was, so, so we were driving the other day, and I said, after our three-week vacation, I said, driving, I said, what'd you think of our vacation? And here's what she said, I'm going to, I'm going to, don't correct me, please. I said, uh, what would you think of our vacation? And she said, um, not my favorite. And I was like, wait, what? She said, nope, not my favorite. I need a beach. And I was like, well, uh, you did stuff and we did some things. And she's like, nope, need a beach. Uh, and I was like, I know, but we did some things. And she's like, nope, need a beach. That was it. And so we, went, we, we drove for probably a few miles quietly. And I said, well, are you going to ask me what I thought of our vacation? She said, nope. <laughs> and I was like, you don't even care about it? Well, I thought she said, like, uh-uh. I said, well, let me tell you. It was my favorite vacation. I love staying home. I love, I love being home. And I know where my cords are. I know where my saws are. I know where my yard. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a weird man. I like, I like working in my yard. In fact, I got a couple of pictures here for you. I like stacking firewood. Look at that. There's a couple of them. Show us around. Look at that. I got still some things to do. Um, I do need some therapy. Uh, I, there's my yard. There we go. So come on now. There you go. My, my team uh, said, Lance, you may need some therapy. But uh, I will tell you, um, peace. Right? Yeah. Jesus' name. I know where all my lawn tools are. All my lines are straight. It's awesome. And you know what? None of that stuff told me I was wrong. I loved it. I was awesome. 
<laughs> Jesus' name. I listened to lots of books. It was amazing. Um, anyway, it was amazing. So she's like, didn't want to hear any of that. So it was amazing. But it was, I had an amazing time. We had actually a really good time. Good times to talk. Um, and you know, one of the things that we did get to go to the Titanic uh, exhibit up in Seattle. I don't know if any of you guys get to go up there and see that. Um, while I was away, uh, or while we were away, I, I did, I don't know if you realize this, but God is always talking. He's always talking. He's always speaking. He's always communicating. His intention for us is to always be talking to us in everything that we're doing. Sometimes um, we get this idea that we need to be doing a spiritual thing for God to be speaking to us. You are a spiritual being. You realize that, right? You are spiritual, and God is always speaking to you, regardless of whether you're driving a bus, pushing a pencil, working on a keyboard, or um, driving whatever you're doing, pushing a lawnmower. It doesn't really matter. God's speaking to you. The real question is, is are you listening to what God's saying to you? Right? Right? I don't know if you realize that, but I'm telling you, he is. As I was praying for you in this, in this summer break we had, I kept on hearing the Lord just say, hey, like, I want to speak to my people. The real question is, is will we listen? Like, we're in a really precarious time. Do you realize that God has us, God has you, you and I, in this season for such a time as this? Right now. He has us all in this season right now. He, he does. He has uh, Pastor Laura um, led us into a really great song a minute ago. Um, you are the same God. You are the same God. Right? That song we were just singing, it was talking about um, all the different people, David, Moses, all the, the people we were just singing about, right? That Ruth, Esther, those people weren't in the song, but you get the idea, right? God put them in time for such a time as this. Daniel, God put them in, for in this moment for such a time as this. He's placed you in this season in life for such a time as this. Do you know that God put you here not just so that you can vote for your political party? Do you know that, right? He didn't just put you here to vote for that particular party. You know that, right? You're not just here on planet Earth so that you'll vote for that particular party. That's not why you're here. You're not just here sucking oxygen so that you'll just do something. God put you here for a specific purpose and a specific time. God placed you on planet earth right now, 2024, for a purpose. That's either going to make your blood flow faster and make you feel excited that God placed you here. What if this is a season that God is going to use and say, hey guys, I placed you here because I've given you a divine assignment. And this divine assignment is going to propel you forward. What if this is the season of his return? And he's decided to place you here to tell the planet that. Oh. Keep talking, preacher. Or does that compel you to say, come on, Lance. Come on, I got to hear what you got to say. As we were at the Titanic exhibit thing, I was sitting there, um, I was compelled by a few things, right? I was, you know, you, I, I'm a history guy. I like to look and read history and study history. Um, I, I'm, I'm a nerd when it comes to that stuff. But I, when it comes to things, I was struck by some of the things. And again, far be it from me to draw a conclusion because, shoot, I hope I'm never in some frigid ice water having to decide on things. I mean, come on, forgive me if that's the case. That, golly. But I'll tell you this. I was struck by a few things. There were people making decisions, life and death decisions that on my side of 80 degree weather, looking at an exhibit, I was drawing all sorts of you dummy conclusions. Come on. Right? In other words, do you realize that the first lifeboat dropped into the water was supposed to have contained or, or, or able to, I'm mean, going to, the numbers are going to, they're a little walk. I look at some of the numbers, a couple different websites, and they weren't hundred percent in agreement. So don't lose your mind. But there was something like this. The first lifeboat dropped into the water was supposed to have been able to hold 67 people. One of the reports I read said the first lifeboat that dropped into the water went away from the ship holding 19 people. 
And they didn't turn around to come pick up people because their fear was their boat would be swamped. So they just decided to leave with 19 people. I heard anywhere from 19 to 26 people. But still, half, more, more than half, less than half of the people that could have been in that boat, it went away. There were several of the lifeboats filled with less than the capacity. And over 1,500 and some odd people drown in that moment. And you know, you think to yourself like, well, Lance, you don't know. Well, Lance, you don't know. Here's the thing. Lance doesn't know. I don't know. Neither do you. But what I was drawn to was that we're living in a moment in time right now. When Jesus could return, well, he's going to return. We know that. And I don't know how compelled you are to share that fact with the people that you're living around. I don't know how, I don't know how quickly you are to hand your life vest out to the people living next to you. I don't know how compelled you are to hand the life vest off to the political party you're in opposition to in your neighborhood person. You know, the red team or the blue team or whatever team you're not, you're going to hand a life vest off to them or do you care? You, 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 we're so weird. We're like weird guys snap out of it. This is heaven and hell. This is life and death. We're losing our minds over the dumbest things. God has placed you here for such a time as this. The devil has clouded our eyes. We've got to figure it out. Okay, got your attention. What is God saying to you? Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Moses, at this point, is 40 years old, or 80 years old. Moses is 80 years old. Um, 80-year-old Moses, 80-year-old Moses. Moses wasn't always 80 years old. At one point, Moses was an infant. Uh, while Moses, you're turning your Bibles or flipping them over or scrolling down, Moses was an infant. Remember, he was back in Egypt. Back in that moment, his parents were slaves. They were making bricks. They were doing all that stuff. Moses was born. Remember, Pharaoh got a little jumpy, and he was like, hey, man, these Hebrew slaves are having all kinds of babies. We got to stop putting into this. And so he's like, oh, gosh, we got to do something to this. So let's kill a bunch of babies because, dear heavens, those, these Hebrews are out pacing us. So tells the midwives, hey, kill some babies. And they were like, we're not doing that, right? So anyway, that whole thing, right? All that stuff's going on. So ended up, Moses ends up being raised in Pharaoh's house. We'll talk about that. But all we know now is that through a chain of events, Moses ends up 80 years old in the desert. And we'll get back to that in a minute. But Moses ends up in the desert at 80 years old. Moses ends up in the desert at 80 years old. 40 years had passed. He was a Hebrew slave prior to this. Or he was, he was in Pharaoh's house prior to this. If we go back to that moment when Moses was in Pharaoh's house, while Moses was back in Egypt, remember how that went when he was a young boy? Remember when, did you know Moses had a brother named Aaron? Moses' his brother's name Aaron. Aaron was three years older than, Aaron was three years older than Moses. Aaron was three years older than Moses. Imagine what that must have felt like for Aaron growing up. Aaron probably didn't have a lot of friends that were his peers because all of those friends were either done away with or snuck in under the throw your kid in the Nile River law, right? So Aaron was three years old and somehow he made it past the edict. So Aaron's like, skin of his teeth alive. His parents are like, stand up tall, son, look five. Don't look three, look five, because if you look three, you could, right? You could look like one of the ones that should have died, but you didn't thing, right? So Moses ends up, remember they, they painted, you saw Charlton Heston, you saw the movie, right? They, 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 they go in the, the basket, gets floated down the river. Anyway, he ends up in Pharaoh's house. Moses gets raised in Pharaoh's house with all the posh, nicest things. Aaron gets raised in the slave's house. Servant's house making bricks from mud and straw. They're three years apart in age. Can I tell you what that's like as a brother? Nothing. Three years means nothing. They're basically the same age. They get raised one in, in complete 
um, all the nice things and one in abject poverty. They're both being raised in the same thing, on and on and on and on. Moses comes back at age 40. While living in Egypt, while his brother was living in slavery, Moses was, now we don't know how many times Moses went over and recognized his family, but we knew that Moses knew he was a Hebrew. Moses eventually goes back to the Hebrews and long story short, ends up murdering a, a, an Egyptian for beating up a Hebrew slave and ends up um, running for his life to a place called Midian. Midian was well, where I want you to turn. Go down to, go down to Exodus chapter 3. So now Moses escapes for his life. He ends up in a place called Midian, which is where we're going to start. So now Moses escapes Egypt. He leaves for 40 years in the back of, side of the desert. Here's where we find him. It's Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, and it says this. One day Moses was tending the flock, and his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, he went deep into the wilderness near Sinai. Everyone say Sinai. Sinai. Yep, that's Sinai. Mount Sinai. Sinai. That's the place where the Ten Commandments were written. That whole thing. Sinai. There's something about Sinai. We're going to get back to that eventually. But Sinai. So Moses now is no longer a prince of Egypt. Moses is now a shepherd. He's a Bedouin shepherd. He's like long beard, ZZ top, no deodorant wearing Bedouin shepherd. That's Moses. He's like... Blah. Like he's like stinky fingernails, long whole thing, right? It's, it's Bedouin shepherd guy. Uh, that's him, right? He's, he's out there goat smelling guy. Do you ever been around a goat? They stinketh. <laughs> I promise. So I can tell you this, right? So, so that's Moses, right? So Moses is now 80. Moses is 80 years old, shepherding sheep out Near Sinai. Sinai. Hmm. Verse 2. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appears to him in blazing fire. Moses in blazing fire of a bush. Moses was amazed. Imagine that. The bush was engulfed in flames, but it didn't burn up. Verse 3. Amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go over and see this. I would have too. Verse 4. The Lord saw that the, he uh, caught Moses' attention. God called him from the bush, said, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, God told him. Take off your sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Pause. By the way, keep in mind, he's now, Moses is in Midian. Moses is over on Mount Sinai, but God is speaking of him back with his, his Hebrew roots. Not his Egyptian roots, his Hebrew roots. He says, the God of your fathers. These, as far as Moses is concerned, he's like, oh shoot, those roots. He's not talking about Pharaoh, his stepdad. He's talking about those roots way back there. He's like, oh, those roots. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob roots. He would say, he's going back there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And he says, when, when Moses heard this, he hid his face in his hands because he was afraid to look at God. Then God told him, you can be sure I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of deliverance for deliverance for their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I have come to rescue them from the Egyptians to lead them out of Egypt into their own good land, spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and Perizzites, Havites, and Jebusites. The cries of my people of Israel have reached me, he says, and I have seen the Egyptians and how they have oppressed them with heavy tasks. I can imagine Moses sitting there right now. First of all, he's like, okay, so that bush ain't burning up. Now he's thinking to himself, yeah, God, about time you should do something. About time I've been out here for 40 years, man, and, and I was serving. I was on Moses' family. I'm telling you what, they're corrupt. He's like, Mo God, good deal. I'm about time. You should fix that because those people, those are my people. And you know what? You should have done something a long time ago, but good thing you're doing something now. How many of you ever done that with the Lord? You're like, mm-hmm, should have do something. Good thing, God. You're just like, well done, God. Mm-hmm. You're like, Good on you, God. All about it. Take it to the next verse. <laughs> verse 10. Then God says this. Now, Moses, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You will lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. How do I know that he was thinking that? Look at verse 11. 
But who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Moses asked. How can you expect me to lead these people out of Egypt? Then God told him, I will be with you. And this will serve as proof that I've sent you and I brought you the Israelites out of Egypt. You will return here to worship God this, on this very mountain. Look at verse 13. But Moses protested. How about that? You ever have God tell you something and you protest? Probably not. If the people of Israel, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors sent me to you, they won't believe me. They will ask, which God are you talking about? What is his name? Then what, God, when, what should I tell them? God replied, I am the one who always is. Just tell them that I am sent you to me, sent me to you. God also said, tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and God of Jacob has sent me to you. I will be, um, this will be my name forever. It has always been my name and will always be used through all generations. We're going to unpack that later on. Verse 16, listen to what he says. Now go and call together all of the leaders of Israel. Tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me in a burning bush. He said, you can be sure that I am watching over you and I've seen what what has happened to you in Egypt? I promise to rescue you from the oppression of the Egyptians. I will lead you into a land occupied by the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, the land flowing with milk and honey. Get this. Here's the promise. He says this in verse 18. The leaders of the people of Israel, this is all your people back home, all the slaves, all those people. He says, they will accept your message. He even tells them in advance, Moses, they're going to listen to you. Just go back and talk to them. They're going to listen. Then all of you must go straight to the king and tell him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer these sacrifices to the Lord. Like he tells them this. All they got to do is go do it. Like God tells them a promise, just go do the thing. How clear could it possibly be? Just believe me. Right? Don't you wish God would just be so bold and just say like, hey, just trust me. Right? And you're just like, man, if God spoke that clear to me, I'd do it. <laughs> Pastor Steve got up here a minute ago and just said, hey, trust God with your money. Just tithe. You're like, yeah, not me. You can, buddy, preacher. I'm not doing it. But too hard, man. Must be easy for you, preacher. You're a, you're a God guy. I'm not a God guy. I work for Boeing. I work for Costco. I'm no God guy. I'm a teacher. Let me tell you this, God girl. You do work for God. Trust him. You're just like Moses. That wasn't even in my notes. God girl. Verse 19. Aren't you glad I came back from vacation? Here we go. Verse 19. But I know, listen to what God says, but I know that the king of Egypt won't let you go except under heavy pressure. Hmm. So I will teach, so I will reach out and strike the heart of Egypt, listen to this, with all kinds of miracles. Then at last he will let you go. And I will see to it that the Egyptians treat you well. How about that? They will load you down with gifts and will not leave you empty handed. The Israelite women will ask, uh, will ask, I'm sorry, the Israelite women, all your buddies, all your family, will ask for silver and gold and fine clothing from the Egyptians um, and their neighbors and guests. With this, clo- uh, with this clothing, they will dress your sons and daughters in this way that you will plunder all the Egyptians. So you wonder how they made it through all the desert for 40 years. You know why? Because all the Egyptians gave them all their gold and silver and fine clothing and fine linen. You wonder how they, like they adorned so many things in Egypt? Right here. That's how God funded their journey in the desert for 40 years. On the way out of Egypt, they just loaded them down with all these goodies. Chapter four, verse one, listen to this. I'll, I'll go quick. But Moses protested again. How about that? Look, they won't believe me, he says. They won't do what I tell them. They'll just say, Lord, the Lord never appeared to you. And the Lord asked them, what do you have in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Okay, go down to verse 10. I'm gonna jump ahead. Verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm not a good speaker. I've never been had, and never have been, um, and I'm not now. Even after you have spoken with me, I am clumsy with my words. You ever felt like you were disqualified for a calling that God had for you? Yeah? 
You ever felt like you were too old for a calling God had for you? Yeah? Aren't you glad that, aren't you glad that you've outaged your calling? Aren't you glad that you're over 80 and you don't have to go back to your calling? Aren't you glad that once you turn 80, you don't have to follow a calling from God anymore? Moses, at 80. Did you know that Moses actually started his calling at 80? What? Did you know that Moses began his calling at 80? That was before they entered into the promised land. He didn't get to go. But I'll tell you all that. That whole journey started at 80. The whole thing started at 80. Let my people go. All started at 80. Do you know that? Aaron, his whole thing that all started at 80. Some of you who aren't 80, 80. Some of you are like, I did my time. I served my time when I was in my 70s and in my 60s and in my 40s. I'm glad all the 30-year-olds have a calling. They should do all the things. Stop it. Stop it, Gen Xers. Stop it, baby boomers. We need you. Amen. Some of you are like, Lance, how old is your church? And I'm like, it doesn't matter because my church is filled with people who are willing. What's the demographic of your church? It doesn't matter. Because our church is a bunch of willing vessels. Amen. Because we're just going to put it on and say go. Hmm. Verse 11 says this. I love God's response to Moses' protest. God says, who makes mouths? When he said, I can't talk. Who makes mouths? Who makes people who can speak and not speak? Um, or hear and not hear, or see and not see. It is I, I the Lord. Now go and do as I told you to do. What a good dad. I will help you, I will help you speak, and I will help you do, say what to say. Moses said again, but Lord, please send someone else. I love it. He's just like me. Verse 14, the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? He's a good speaker. Look, he's on his way to meet you, and I will see that, uh, I will see that he sees you. He's very, um, he will be very glad, and you will talk to him, giving him the words to say. I will help you both speak very clearly and tell you what to do. Aaron will be your spokesperson to the people, and he will be, you will be as God to him and telling him what to say. I love this. He will be, you will be as God to him, telling him what to say. So Moses was going to hear from God. Moses was going to turn after hearing from God and he was going to speak to Aaron and Aaron was going to speak to them. I always think like, what a hassle. Why don't you just move Moses out of the way? Why don't you just speak straight to, just say, Moses, all right, you're a dummy. I'm just going to use Aaron. Right? What in the world? You ever just think like, God, what a hassle. You ever think that, right? Don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where's this sermon going? Let me tell you where it's going. Here's where this sermon's going. You and I, can me tell you this? God has you right where you're supposed to be. Dang it. You didn't mean to come to church today, but you're here. God has you right where you're supposed to be. Dang it. He has you right in that house, right in that cul-de-sac, right at that job. Mm. Mm. Lance, stop talking. He has you right there. You're like, what? You know what's funny? I read this passage and I'm like, what? How come it says Aaron's on his way? Moses talking to God. Moses 80 years old and Aaron's on his way. What in the world for? Aaron becomes a priest. What in the world? It says Aaron's a Levite. How many of you guys know what a Levite is? It's the Levitical priesthood, whatever that is, right? I'm going to spend the next five weeks Actually, five weeks talking about this. I have a guest speaker coming in in a couple of weeks. You're going to dig him. He's going to be amazing. But in the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about the Levitical priesthood. Actually, I'm going to be using a fancy phrase with you, calling, calling you about the priesthood of the believer. It's a fancy phrase, but I'm going to unpack it so you get it, right? Um, I'm not talking to you about the Catholic priesthood because that's weird. Uh, I was raised Catholic and we're not talking about that. But I'm talking to you about what it means to be a priest in the house of God. I love this because Moses had a mouthpiece. His mouthpiece was Aaron. Let me explain. Aaron, um, Aaron was raised in a house of servant who worked making clay bricks for Pharaoh. 
Moses was raised in a house of Pharaoh, right? Let me just put it in a language you can understand. Somebody's going to email me or text me to try to correct me, so please don't. But let, me, let me tell you what. When I read in passage, uh, read Bible, the Bible and try to understand it, there's plenty of times when I'm preaching in front of you, and many of you will email me or text me, and you're like, Lance, I have read that a hundred times, and I never saw that in there. Where did you find that? You guys will say that to me, and you're like, how did you see that, right? And I'm like, I'm not that smart, trust me. I'm just the everyday guy, and I just read it, and I'm like, this is what I see, right? And you're like, man, right? Let me tell you this. You know why? Because I sit, I just sit and read it over and over, like, like this, for example. I think Aaron was just, he was just a dude. I think he was just a guy who just, who hung out with people, who hung out with people. I think, I think in fact, I put it this way. Um, I would say this. You know, the Bible calls you and I a kingdom of priests. Did you know that? In 1 Peter, it actually says this. Um, Rachel, you may put this up, this up there, 1 Peter. It says, and now God is building you, you and me, you and I, we're New Testament Christians. He's building you and I as living stones into a spiritual temple, right? He says, what's more, you and I are God's holy priests. Everyone say holy priests. You and I are holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. That's who you and I are. We're like a holy priesthood, right? Not goofy and weird. Stop watching YouTube. I'm saying we're like, we're really holy priests. What is that? I want to help you understand what it's supposed to be, not what you've read or heard. I want to tell you what a holy, righteous priest is. We're like, we're like, we're like translators, I think Moses heard from God. I think Moses would hear from God and then Moses would say, um, in his best Charleston Heston, he would say, um, hear from God and he would turn around and say, uh, Aaron, this is what we're supposed to say. And then Aaron would go like, uh, Moses, look, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to tell them that, uh, they were not going to hear it like that. Let me tell them how I think they're going to hear it. And he would say, he's trying to say it this way. Um, and then he would tell him. Because I think Aaron understood everyday language. Because Aaron was one of them. Let me tell you this. You are one of them. You are Aaron. I am Aaron. You are a priest. You know language. I'll tell you this. I got myself in trouble one time. You understand. Please do not text me about this. You understand that swear words don't really mean what swear words mean. Come on. You know that, right? They're just, they're just letters. They got stuff behind them. Mm. They got mm behind them, right? Come on. They, they make you feel uncomfortable. Stop it. You, know, you got it, right? Sometimes people whip them out there and like, I'm on a, they say the things and you're like, why are you talking? And then sometimes they look at you and they're like, oh, you're a God person. I'm not going to talk like that around you. Has it ever happened around you? And they're like, oop, you're a God guy. You're a God girl. I can't talk like that around you. And then they apologize. And you say to yourself, like, I'm good. Or you, or you say thank you or whatever you say, right? But you know, you, you can do the translating, right? You can translate and you're like, there's some pain in that word. There's some pain under the surface. Get this, translator, you. You translator. You, you translator, you. You're translating. You're, you know what you're doing? You just turn right around and love them right where they're at, because you're like Aaron. You, you translator. You know what you do? You just love them. You don't have to drop the words back at them. You just love them where they're at. And you just say like, hey, no big deal. I'm good. So when I get around people who start getting crazy with that stuff, you know what I do? I don't do that. I just don't, I don't flinch. Ain't no big deal. Because it doesn't matter to me because it's all just meaning something other than what it is. Most of the time, it doesn't mean anything anyway. Just don't lose your minds. Just be you. 
be Aaron. Don't text me about that. You get it? I'm trying to say this. Moses would hear from God. I'll put it this way. Listen to this. I think Aaron had the heart of captive people that needed to find the freedom of a loving God. I think Aaron had the heart of captive people. Captive people don't talk like godly people. They talk like captive people. Lost people talk like lost people. You got that? Lost people don't talk like found people. Aaron had the heart of captive people that needed to find a free God and a loving God. You got it? Aaron had the heart of captive people that needed to find the freedom of a loving God. However, Moses had the heart of God who intended on bringing freedom to captive people. Moses needed Aaron. Aaron needed Moses. Amen. You hear from God, your job is to deliver the groceries in a manner that's understandable. Right? Sometimes people hear a message like this and they're just like, okay, so now I got to start acting like them. No, you don't. Don't be dumb. Don't be weird. Just act like Jesus. Jesus didn't have to act weird to reach people who didn't know any better. Jesus was just righteous and holy. I love the fact that Jesus hung out with Tax collectors and sinners. You do the math on that one. And hung out with um, people of the night. Whatever that is, right? So he, he, you know, he didn't do, he didn't do the things, right? He just hung out with people who, you know, come on now. But Jesus was, he was righteous and holy and set apart. But he, he, he didn't partake. Don't partake. But Jesus was other than right? He was a priest and a prophet and a king, right? So we, I want to help you understand how to walk in the priesthood of a believer over this next several weeks. I'm going to help you understand your language, help you understand how you carry yourself and all of that. Amen? Amen. I love, I love how, I love how God, I love how Moses, I, I'm certain that some of you are like Lance. I've been wanting to move out of this cul-de-sac in the worst way. I've been wanting to leave this situation I'm in yesterday. I've been asking Jesus to remove me from this bleh, and I can't, and I don't know why. I've been trying to sell this darn house, and it will not sell. I've been trying to, trying to, trying to, and now I show up to church, and you say I'm supposed to be right where I'm at. All I'm saying to you is, is I don't know, man. Maybe God's in it. Maybe God has given you the gift of Aaron, the priest, and he's telling you, hey, I have you here for such a time as this. I don't know. Maybe God just has us here on this planet for such a time as this. Here's what would be awesome for us all to move to somewhere and dig a big hole and bury a bunch of food and hide away in it until Jesus comes and just bury a big thing and just all hide and let everyone else go to hell. Is that what we want to do? No. No. Although that's what some would like us to do. I don't want to be that guy. I want us to go be light in the darkness and hope and despair. That's what God placed us here for. That's who I'm going to be. So how about you come help me out? Amen. So how do you do that? Glad you asked. I'm going to teach you how to do a couple of things, five things. I'm going to have Diana post this somewhere on one of our socials somewhere. One of the things we have to do is we need to learn how to stand in the gap. Um, there's another fancy word for it. It's an intercessor. But I'm going to show you how to stand in the gap. And how to do that? We need to learn how to love our neighbors as ourselves. Right? So Matthew 22 um, says this. Jesus replied, you must love your neighbor as yourself. You, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. How do we stand in the gap or be an intercessor? The second thing we need to do is love, uh, walk in humility, right? Some of us are so prideful, we can't see past our own navel. 
we got to stop, stop looking at our own belly buttons and worrying about all of our own things because we think we're the most important person. Some of us may have to take the life jacket off of our neck and hand it to somebody who needs it and start thinking about somebody else and start walking about our own, our own thing and thinking about somebody else's thing. Amen? Yikes. Number three, we need to learn how to be generous. Proverbs eleven twenty five says this, the generous prosper and are satisfied. Those who are refreshed, all those who refresh others will refresh for themselves, be refreshed. Um, this is so funny. We were, Polly and I were at a dinner the other night with some family and we had a, a thing where uh, we have a, a family member who's going on a mission trip and inevitably somebody's going somewhere in our family somewhere. And so she had, she had reached out and asked for Polly and I to support them financially to go on their mission trip because why not? And so they were like, hey, Lance, Uncle Lance, can you help us out, right? So, and so um, so I did everything I could to dodge because you do too. So how many can requests can you get, right? So we were, Polly's like, Lance, we've got to respond because they're asking us for dough. And so um, don't look at me like that. So so she asked, and so um, Polly's like, we've got to answer. And so I, I leaned over to Polly. Polly was sitting down so kindly at the table. And I was standing up behind her and I was like, hey, hon, um, what do you want to give? And Polly's like, and I'm a dummy. If, if I ever ask my, my wife how much we're supposed to give, ever, if I ask her, she always shoots high. Like she never shoots low, ever. Like I should have just learned that like every time. Like I should just pick a number and then, then she'll shoot up a little bit. But I never should start with what do you want to give, right? Uh, and so I did and she's like, we should just give this, right? And so I'm like, now what am I going to do? Go low? Like, then I just like a curmudgeon. And so I'm like, yes, we should do that, right? So I said, okay, let's do that, right? And so, ah, and so we, you know, we have some cash around in our house. So I was like, all right, honey. So I go up and I put it in an envelope and we handed it to our niece. And um, the whole time I'm like, Lord, you're good. And Polly looks at me and she goes, Lance, before I, before I said yes to the thing, she goes, she, she's like, Polly, she never does this physically, but she looks at me right in the eyes and she goes, Lance, you know God is good. And I was like, I know. She goes, no, no, no. You know he's good. He's always good. And I'm like, I know, man, I'm a preacher. And she's like, stop it. You know he's good. He always does this and he always gives it back all the time, right? And so I'm like, I know. And she's like, no, stop it. You know it, right? And so he's already, right? So then like the next day I'm at work and I literally come walking in and somebody here at church walks up and says like, hey, I have this weird thing. God just tells me I'm supposed to hand you this. And like they handed me it back out of nowhere. They're like, I don't know why. Lord just told me to give you this. And it was exactly the amount. And I was like, Lord, I'm such a dummy, right? And so, and I'm like, I'm not going to tell Polly. Ah! <laughs> right. Uh, like, what an idiot. Right. So God's so good. Right. In fact, like he's given it back to us twice already. Yeah, it's hilarious. God's so good. Um, be generous. And I'll tell you this, if we're going to, if we're going to be like Aaron, I can tell you this. Number four, keep your eye on somebody who's keeping their eye on Jesus. I want to teach you how to keep your eye on somebody who's keeping their eye on Jesus. First Corinthians, like Paul says this, you need to follow an example of somebody. Follow, example, follow my example just as I follow Christ, right? You can read your Bible all you want to and think you're doing it all right, but you need to follow somebody who's following Christ. Run and keep up with somebody who's doing it, right? I, I just, I tell you what, you got to follow somebody who's doing it because otherwise, man, you just, you can't, you just can't do it by yourself, Right? And, and then right now, if you think you're doing it well, make sure someone's following you. If not, pull someone behind you and say, keep up, right? I'll tell you this, number five, listen for the voice of the Lord, then follow after it. John 10, 27 says this, my sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me, right? You need to hear from his voice. He's speaking, we just gotta be listening. Amen? So I'll tell you this, there's two things I wanna do right now. Um, some of you today are like, Lance, I want to be a priest in the house of God. I want to learn how to be a priesthood of believers, but I'm not so sure I'm a believer. If I were to die today, I'm not so sure I'd be counted as a believer. If that's you today and you want to be a Christian, 
Let's sell that. You gotta be a Christian before you can be the priesthood. You wanna be, you, want, you gotta be a Christian. And maybe you like walked away from Jesus, but you need to come back. Get that taken care of. You don't need to get resaved, but you need to get realigned with him. Amen? Let's dial that back in, right? Because we, we got some stuff to do. I want to help you learn how to be generous. I want to help you learn how to follow someone who's following Christ. I want to help you figure that out. But get some things back in order. Let's do that. So let's pray. Jesus, maybe there's somebody here today or someone who's watching this online who's never walked with you ever and they've never surrendered their life to Jesus. If that's you right now and you've never done that, right now just say, Jesus, I give my life to you. You found me. You got me. I need to give my life to you. If that's you, just say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give you me, all of me, all the deep, dark, uglies, all the things that, yuck, I don't need it anymore. God, I surrender. You got me. I give you me. And maybe it's the first time in a long time. And I used to walk with you. I used to, I used to sing songs. I used to read my Bible. I used to pray. And now I don't. And I want to. I need to. I rededicate my life to following you today. Today, God, I re-surrender my life to following you today. God, I, I give my life to you. I realign my life with you today. Today's a new day. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed either of those two prayers today, I just need you after church today to walk up to one of the two sides. Where there's going to be some people there who just want to pray over you and say, welcome home or give you a Bible or whatever it is you need and maybe help you find that journey. In a couple of weeks, we're going to offer a class that's going to help you get on track a little bit. So, but just at least tell somebody because there's nothing worse than saying, hey, I rededicated my life to following Christ and not tell somebody because there's always a little voice that says, no, you didn't. So tell somebody so that they can help you know that, right? Amen. Last thing I'm going to tell you is this. Um, there's this CR, Run for Life. You've seen these little red things sitting around on those tables out there. Listen, um, they, they call it a, a fun run. I've never used those two words in the same sentence. There's nothing fun about running. But I'll tell you this. Um, I've been trying to shed a little weight, right? And so I'll tell you this. I'm actually going to do a fun walk. I've already signed up for it. I clicked the, the, the code in the back and I signed up for it. Um, I'm going to do the walk here on the 7th of September. It's going to be up on Buckley. Um, CR, we're going to support CR. Listen, it's about dealing with your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. It's in Puyallup, Bradley Park. Same-ish, right in there, area, Bradley Park. But I'll tell you this, come and be a part of it if you follow it on the map. Uh, but please, can you sign up for it? It's going to be fun. It's going to support people who have um, walked through hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And listen, if you breathe and blink, you have one of those. A hurt, habit, or hang-up. So sign up, go walk, be a part of it. You don't have to run because I am not going to run. Um, I'm going to walk. Deal? God bless you. Why don't you stand to your feet? Be encouraged. Don't forget next week, 10 o'clock here. If you show up early, you're setting up chairs. Um, love you. God bless you. Give